It's no secret that real estate is one of the best investment vehicles out there. But how can we determine which strategies will best align with our financial ambitions? Well, you've come to the right spot. Whether you're an active real estate entrepreneur, a passive investor, or looking to get into real estate investing, our goal is to provide investors with the insights and strategies for building our portfolios all while protecting our capital. I'm Daniel Nichols, and this is the Two Smart Assets Real Estate Investing Podcast. Hey guys, real quick before we jump into the show, do me a huge favor and leave a rating and review for the podcast. We're always looking to bring you guys the best insights and strategies for building our real estate portfolios and your ratings and reviews really help with getting top guest speakers that are the best in the real estate investing business. I promise this will only take you a few seconds to get done and I'd really appreciate it. Thanks again for being awesome guys. All right, let's get into the show. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Daniel Nichols, accompanied by our guest for the week, Lior Rosansky. And today we are the two smart assets. For those that are familiar with Lior, he is managing member of Flora Capital. He has years of experience in the multifamily investing space with his first acquisition coming at the age of 23. Since then, he has built up a large multifamily portfolio valued at around $30 million through strategic partnerships with capital partners, real estate investors, and other key stakeholders. Lior, my man, it is great to see you. Welcome to the show having me here really excited to do this yeah dude pumped pumped to get into this you know we had a great conversation a little bit before hitting record um so it's awesome learning more about you man uh, super excited about today's conversation diving into you know what you're up to and uh the market you're investing in uh before we do that though man we want to hear more about you so tell us more about your background your story and how you got into real estate i uh, love it yes yeah. so uh you know my background is uh, i call myself a destined to be doctor turned real estate investor uh, you know, I kind of classic immigrant story, moved here to the States. Uh, parents really wanted me to be a doctor or lawyer, mainly a doctor. Um, so, you know, did my whole pre-med track in uh, undergrad, uh, took a kind of like a consulting job while I was applying to med schools and uh, kind of just very randomly decided, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna toss an offer on a piece of property and see what happens. Um, you know, my buddies, I had a couple of buddies that were contractors. They were talking about buying property. And I was like, yeah, I can do it better than you guys. <laughs> uh, cl very classic, humble myself. So, uh, you know, kind of that's how I honestly, that's how I jumped into it. Um, kind of bought my uh, three family right here in Boston with, uh, you know, a, a little neighborhood 10 minutes outside the city. Um, still actually own that property today. But, you know, since then, it's kind of just been on rocket fuel, right? Um, at first jumped in, uh, did a couple of condo developments, thought I was a genius, learned quite a bit, lost a little money as well. Um, but, you know, those were amazing learning experiences where I really learned a lot about construction, managing projects. Um, you know, those were almost essentially new construction projects. Um, but then since then, turned my focus on multifamily, you know, started buying a lot of multifamily all around Boston. Um, you know, the first couple of years, like I was telling you before, was focused on, you know, like a lot of operators when they start out kind of on class C assets, sure. um, you know, where we kind of looked at growing areas that I thought could change over the next five, 10 years. Um, still love those areas, but over the last 12, 24 months, I've really pivoted and shifted. Um, and now we're really buying a lot of, you know, kind of upper class B and class A locations around the Boston area. So that's, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Well, you know, that's, that's quite the journey there, right? And I got to tell you, man, I think, you, well, you know, a little bit what I knew about you before the show is that your background, you know, you graduated, what was it biochem? Is that right? Uh, I got to tell yeah, you, I got to tell you, man, uh, coming out of the school as an engineering major, um, I took biochem and that was not my favorite class. I can promise you that much. Uh, so props, not props easy, to you on graduating. Not an easy path. <laughs> yeah, prop, props to you for graduating with the biochem degree, dude. That's awesome. Um, so let's dive into the real estate stuff, man. Uh, you know, you talked about your first property. Take us back a little bit that, you know, I know you said you kind of Kind of, you know, you're talking to your buddies, hey, we can, I could do better than that and all that kind of stuff. Talk about, you know, that first property, how you acquired it, how, how you were able to find uh, an opportunity in a high price market. Cause you know, most people, they start their first property, maybe it's in their backyard, maybe it's not, but they're usually looking, for, obviously everybody's looking for a deal, but in a high price market, maybe that's a little bit more difficult. So talk to us about how you were able to uh, find that opportunity and how you were able to fund it, all that good stuff. Yeah, you know, one, one thing I quickly figured out, and it honestly is still a very central uh, core of my philosophy even today, is, you know, I, I understood Boston was a very expensive market even back then in, you know, 2016 when I first started looking. But I kind of understood the dynamics of the market, right? I, kind of, mm -hmm. I did a lot of research, really studied the market and saw, look, like, what's kind of my worst case scenario, right? I mean, we have all these industries, we have 
you know, historic infrastructure that is not going away any, anytime soon. You know, and like we were talking before the show, right? Like, you know, we have institutions like Harvard, MIT, we have a biotech pharma hub, we have a finance hub. Um, so I'm just a very, very big believer in the stability and durability of the city, right? So, you know, as I kind of thought through it, I thought, you know, it's, it's hard for me to picture something going terribly wrong, right? Uh, you know, I looked at the data even in 08, um, you know, Boston compared to many of the other markets was much more resilient, right? I mean, did not get as impacted nearly as bad as the majority of the country. So that's what kind of gave me the confidence to go in, um, you know, and try to invest in an expensive market. In terms of how I structured it, I mean, you know, kind of like a typical first time investor, I uh, used an owner occupant loan, um, you know, put a low down payment down just to kind of get into the game and really understand what I'm dealing with. Sure. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's how I financed it. Took a little muscle, but you know, pushed right through it. Love it, man. So what was your plan for that property when you bought it? You know, was it, was this going to be a rehab? You're going to turn, obviously you still have it today, but when you first bought it, was it something you knew you were going to hold on to uh, for long term? Did it need a value add or was it kind of more turnkey? Um, it was, I would say light value add, you know, I cool. kind of painted, ripped it, basic little, uh, upgrades, N- nothing crazy, nothing, no, nowhere near the scope of what I do today. Um, but yeah, I, I did want to hold on to that property for the long term. Um, you know, like I said, I studied this, that even that specific sub market, um, you know, at the time there was rumblings that a, a casino was potentially coming in, that Wynn was coming in to build something. He ended up building it over the last couple of years. Um, and you know, it's, and that, and that sub market is continuing to change every day right now. Um, so I kind of looked at, you know, what's going on there today, what, what I think is going to happen there tomorrow. And based on that, you know, kind of said, why don't I try and hold on to this thing and see what happens? I think that's a great strategy. You know, you're really looking at the path of progress, right? The potential path of progress. So I think being able to have that outlook and that long-term vision is super important, especially as as a new investor, right? You're going to be like, hey, man, unless you're flipping or whatever, I think that is super important. In fact, I have one of my first single family properties. I bought it. uh, It was very near a college, like right near a college, right? And, uh, but it was on a great street. Um, It was just, it was just a great area. And I still have it today. I mean, cash flow is great. Um, is it the best property? Probably not, but uh, it's in it's in a great area, and you know, like I said, it cash flows very well. So I think uh, being able to hold on to those properties, even if they're not exactly what your current focus is, uh, still plays into your portfolio, right? So um, I think it's awesome. All right, so your first real estate investing experience was a success. It's a success, and then you started diving into some other things. Now you're doing you know bigger deals. You're raising uh, for a fund, all those kind of stuff. Let's fill in the gaps there. You mentioned some condos. Talk to us about those condos. What were those like? You said you learned a lot from those. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, you know, so I kind of my next step in the journey. Uh, I did that first deal. You know, thought I thought I knew everything under the sun. So I hopped into uh, you know gut rehab slash new construction of condo deals um, in a neighborhood in Boston. Um, those were, you know, very, very intense projects. Um, you know, both were two, two projects, three units each, you know, construction budgets of like 130, 150 per unit. Um, you know, they, they, they were big, big projects. Um, and, and, you know, it, it was on me to essentially manage the project. I partnered up with a developer um, that had experience. So I was kind of running, you know, doing the sweat equity, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and you learned a lot of lessons, right? Learned learned all about what it takes to manage a construction site, what what it entails, um, you know, all the challenges you can have, uh, the financing and the and you know and the and the uh, funds management behind construction. Um, so it was great, great, great lessons. Um, you know, those projects, uh, you know, ended up being tough, um, but you know, and like I said, uh, one of them actually lost a lot of money on. But the education I gained on them was uh, invaluable, right? I mean, you know, it's kind of the core of how I operate today. Absolutely. Let me ask you a question. So I think that, you know, let's just say, you know, I'm a new investor and, or maybe I've taken down one property, right? I have one single family rental or something like that. And it's gone, it's gone well, you know, it's gone pretty smooth. It was like you said, live value add. Let's just say this is me. Uh, I'm going to look at, you know, a condo project that has, or some sort of project that has heavy value add, right? And I got to be honest with you, man, for me, and for most people I've talked to, they're just going to scare people off. Like, hey, I don't know how to do any of that. What gave you the confidence to go in and say, hey, we could take down this uh, heavy value add, no problem. I mean, yeah, you might've had some struggles, you might've had some challenges, but it seems like you jumped in head first and you were good to go. Yeah, I'd say two things. Uh, one, I mean, I'm very much a numbers guy and mm. I penciled out the math and the math looked pretty good, right? I mean, I, as, simple as, as simple as that, right? I mean, I did all the number work, um, you know, you work with a developer to get construction assumptions. I looked at all the comps and everything and, you know, kind of just saw the opportunity and went for it. 
Um, and then second to, you know, the other part of it is kind of what I talked about before. Uh, both of these pro both of these properties were in very great neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in Boston, uh, within within five, seven minutes of downtown, right? So, I mean, they were premier locations. Um, so again, I kind of have the confidence that w worst case scenario, I mean, we still have a fully, you know, fully brand new three condos or three family, um, you know, so the downside I thought would be relatively mitigated. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. So for our listeners who are out there who are, who are potentially looking to get into, you know, heavy value add, maybe they're looking at opportunities uh, that they need a lot of work. Uh, do you have any words of like wisdom or advice or tips or anything that you could share? Uh, when, you know, whether that's underwriting assumptions, budgeting, project management, any of that stuff. I think there's a lot of, a lot of things that could slip through the cracks if you don't know about it ahead of time. So you've already been through this. Any tips uh, for our listeners? Yeah. I mean, if, if you're going to be doing heavy value add, um, you know, at first, at first, I'd say if it's your first time, definitely partner up with someone. Do not take on like a gut rehab by yourself. Um, you know, I mean, there's just so many little things that you would never think about. Um, you know, it's just why, why learn on your own, you know, why learn it by yourself when you can leverage the experience of others, right? So number one, 100% partner up with someone that knows what they're doing. Um, it's going to save you money, frustration, headaches, emotional pain, everything. Uh, you know, and I can yeah. tell you cause I've been scarred. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so that, that's number one, um, number two, just understand what you're getting yourself into. Right. I mean, these, these heavy value add projects, especially when you're first starting out. Um, and even, you know, e even when you have a system and a team, I mean, they're intense, right. It's not, it's not a walk in the park. I mean, if you're, especially if you're like gutting units or close to it, um, you know, this, it's an intense operation. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of moving pieces. Um, you know, the inventory we're buying in Boston, most of the inventory is like old, you know, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s kind of inventory, right? So these are old buildings, haven't been touched in 100 years, right? So there's just so many curveballs that can happen. Um, so just be, un just understand that this is not, a, this is not like a walk in the park, right? There's a lot of different factors you're going to have to mitigate, uh, work through, to take control of. So it's, uh, you know, it's it's a completely different ballgame. Yeah, absolutely. And I got to tell you, man, that uh, your point about having a partner, absolutely critical. I got to tell you a quick story. I was, uh, it was my first flip and really, uh, it was really my only flip, but we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. But uh, my first flip, I was like, I'm going to do all this on my own. And I did, man. Uh, you know, I was trying to do all the construction myself, uh, basically do all the work myself. And I got to tell you, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, I lost time. Uh lost money. I mean, I didn't lose at the end. It was okay. It turned out okay. But at the same time, man, it took me twice as long as I thought it was going to take to finish this project. Right. And it was just one of those things. Like if I would have gone in with at least somebody who knew kind of what they were doing, I probably would have been better off. Right. Uh, and so I think that it's huge. Uh, if you're looking for a heavy value add, whether it's a flip or just, you know, fixing up a rental or whatever, definitely partner with somebody who knows what they're doing um, going into that. So love that piece, man. Um, all right, man. So I'm going to shift a little bit, you know, you're in Boston. Um, it's an expensive market, right? If, if people just, I mean, you hear Boston, you know, it's going to be an expensive market, right? It's kind of like we were talking about it earlier, you know, Denver, I, I'm based just outside of Denver, not a cheap area either. It's just one of those things. Uh, so I think for, you know, for a lot of newer investors or people who are entering a real estate investing in these markets, it can be very frustrating, right? Especially to find deals. Cause it's like, man, none of these pencil, you know, how am I going to get entry into this market? So, um, in your experience, how have you been able to remain? I mean, you're still buying in Boston. How have you been able to remain competitive in such an expensive market like Boston? Yeah, so you, you got to really figure out what your angle and strategy is, right? Mm -hmm. So product here is very expensive, right? I mean, our average acquisition price is probably somewhere between four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars per unit, um, and you know these are typically old units that need a lot of work. Um, so you need to figure out what your angle is, and for us. Um, you know, for me, from almost from day one, it's been the construction portion, right? I understand where I can drive value. I understand what I can do, um, you know, what needs to be done to drive certain rents on the back end, you know, and, and I kind of have almost like a little bit of a niche expertise in that regard, right? Because I know a handful of markets. I don't even know, I, I, I wouldn't say I know all the markets in Boston, right? There's, we operate in specific sub markets that we really believe in, that we really like, that you know, that we think are great, and we've just absolutely mastered them, right? Like I know what kind of package finishes I need to go in one sub market versus the other. I know if it's going to get me X amount of extra rent versus not. Um, you know, so I guess my point is, you know, if you if you're going to compete in these like 
you know, it, it really in any market, but especially if you're going to play kind of where really like the big boys play, right? Like the Boston's, the New York's, the LA's of the world, um, even Denver, right? And like, you know, I know Denver's isn't cheap. Um, you know, you, you got to really know your stuff. You got to really have a competitive advantage. So you got to figure out what that is, whether it's, um, you know, like I said, whether it's understanding c- certain sub markets, um, understanding certain types of inventory, um, whatever it is, you you need an advantage. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's super critical. And I think for for people who are, are looking to, you know, break into that market or, you know, whatever it is, like you said, you got to have an advantage. But if you don't have that advantage, kind of the point we're going back to where to find somebody who does have the advantage that you can bring value to, right? Go ahead, add va- see if you can do something for them, you know, whether it's, you know, some sort of task or whatever. I think that's massive. So um, you're absolutely right. You got to be able to find your niche. There's riches in the niches. And if you can actually get down to that, I think it's going to be uh, super critical. So, you know, we don't hear much about Boston on this show. Um, I know you mentioned a little bit about this, a little bit about this earlier. Talk to us more about that market. What are some of the pros and cons of of, of Boston itself and the submarkets there? And you know, what is it? What does it look like in terms of job diversity? You know, population growth, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I'd say again, the re- the reason why I love Boston, why we're going to continue to buy here, is first of all, it's an incredibly established market, right? It's not. It's not like your ultra growth market like you might find in the south southeast southwest right that are starting to blow up over the last couple of years i mean this city's been around for 100 years right and and it, and i firmly believe that it's going to continue to be here right um you know we kind of talked we talked a little bit off air but you know the the day you know the day that uh, harvard and mit decided to pack shop like <laughs> i'll continue to buy stuff here right because they're going to continue to be here which means all of their lab space is going to be here, which means all the talent is going to continue to come here, which means the companies are going to continue to come here, right? So it's all, it all progresses. It all stems from each other. Um, I mean, industry diversity is incredible, right? I mean, healthcare, education, pharma, biotech, finance, um, high tech, right? I mean, it's li- we've literally got ev- almost every industry. So we're not relying on one specific industry, um, maybe like other markets are, um, you know, which gives a lot of safety to it. You know, you started, you know, with a small multifamily, you're still doing some of that stuff, but you were focused on maybe something like C-class before. And now you said you transitioned more into BB plus, maybe A minus, something like that. Why the transition? Why not just stick with what you were doing before that was working so well? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think, especially in the face of, of uh, you know, kind of economic concern that we're seeing right now, I think going into these kind of class C areas, even though a lot of the stuff we've invested in the past, I see, I still see a lot of like tremendous growth. Mm-hmm. I still see it as a riskier proposition today, right? Um, you know, because, you know, if it, those are the tenants that typically get hit first, right? It's kind of the easiest way that I think about it. You know, if someone's kind of, you know, you're providing uh, workforce housing, blue collar housing, however you want to think about it, if there's any sort of dip, any sort of uh, even mini recession, right? I mean, those are typically the jobs um, that get hit first. Those are the tenants that typically have the least ability. Whereas if you're renting to kind of professionals and tech, finance, healthcare, right? I mean, those, those industries tend to be a lot less, uh, you know, tend to get a lot less shocked um, sure. in, if something happens. So I do see it as a very resistant play. Um, and, you know, the more kind of the, the more we kind of evolved as investors, I mean, my whole goal in investing is I play the long term game, right? I, sure. you know, I don't, I don't need I don't need to be a billionaire tomorrow. Uh, I've got, you know, I'm, I'm obviously a younger guy. I've got a long runway in front of me. So when I think about what assets do I want to buy for myself and my investors, I kind of think about, you know, from the perspective of what would I be really proud and happy and like really thrilled to own in 10 years, right? And, you know, and when you think, when you kind of think about it that way, you say, well, you know, is it kind of like that dumpy duplex that's like in the middle of nowhere that maybe produces a thousand dollars a month of cash flow, but, you know, where is it going? Not really, right? Like that's, you know, a thousand bucks is great, but that's not what we're playing the game here for, right? So, um, you know, we I, I really kind of look at those, um, you know, kind of like almost trophy assets and trophy locations where I know they're going to be indestructible. I know they're going to be there tomorrow in a decade and 30 years, right? So th- those are the things that I'm going to, that I really want to kind of lay my wealth foundation on. Um, so that's why I kind of decided to focus on it. Yeah, I really like that uh, that outlook and that mindset, right? It's really a win-win situation, especially if you think on longer time horizons. Because if you're thinking something just a year, two years, three years, yeah, okay, well, but if you think about, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, like you said, 30 years, uh, I think that those, you know, it kind of shifts your mental uh, strategy and kind of, especially in the real estate investing game, what you're looking for, right? Uh, especially if you're looking for a long-term hold piece, like 
like you said, trophy assets. I absolutely love that. So, you know, with that in mind, you've kind of got your, your, your niche down here in, in Boston and in the, in the, the Boston Metro right around there. Do you think you'll ever expand into other markets or are you going to stay focused in, in Boston? No, we've definitely talked about expanding. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the issues though, I've seen from talking and networking with many other investors syndicated across the country um, and maybe issues is not the wrong word, but one of the things I still don't really understand is how one group can maybe operate in five or six different markets and really command expertise, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's always been one of the things that I've, you know, I, it never really clicked with me. So the way we're thinking about it is we first want to really set up a world-class shop in Boston, right? And, and that's what we're doing right now. So we, you know, we're growing our team, we're hiring pretty actively. Um, and my goal over the next, say, 12 to 24 months is really establish a strong, like solidified operation um, with great people. And once I have that, then I think, think I'll kind of have a better base of, uh, you know, starting to think about, do we expand, right? Because then our operations are tight here and then we can go choose maybe one other market and kind of play it exactly like we did Boston, right? Learn Mm -hmm. it inside out, understand, you know, network with everyone, understand exactly where we can get a competitive edge and then build and basically replicate the shop. So yeah, I've definitely had the South and Southeast on my, you know, on my radar. I mean, obviously those have been tremendous growth markets, um, but I just don't want to expand prematurely and I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to expand too hard. Right. I think going into too many markets at once, um, even though it can look awesome when you talk about it to people. Right. I, I think operationally and from a true execution perspective, if you're really going to deliver the best results, I, you know, I, I think you got to really get good at one thing at a time. Yeah, absolutely. I think staying focused on, you know, that one thing and really just 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 growing on that and putting all your attention on that is really going to be the best thing before scaling for anybody, right? It depends, I mean, really with anything. So I think being able to build that foundation is absolutely massive. Dude, uh, it's been great learning about your story. Um, you know, the Boston market, which I didn't know much about going into this. So absolutely awesome. Before we get out of here, tell the listeners, you know, how they can find about uh, more about you and anything else you have going on. Yeah, uh, I'm all you know. I'm pretty active on Instagram and LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me on there. Um, I've also got a, a free ebook, which I'm sure will be on um, you know on the podcast notes. Uh, you know, I kind of wrote that because, as I said, you know, I started in um, the management consulting space right after school. Uh, you know, I did two years of that. I worked that sixty to seventy hour shifts, um, traveled. So I, I know what it's like when you're kind of in the you know in the corporate space and all your life is basically focused on delivering on the corporate results and you know, it's hard, it's hard to focus on anything else, right? I mean, it really is. It's hard, it's hard to explore other investments, alternatives. I mean, when I, you know, when I got going on trying to research real estate, um, you know, I kind of have to do it on my lunch break on my phone and people would like make fun of me, right? <laughs> it was like our 15 minutes off. So, I, you know, I, I felt that pain. Um, so that's kind of why I wrote that book really, you know, and kind of like you, I know you preach, like help people really understand what their options are. Um, you know, cause you, you got to take control of your own future. So, yeah, Ab- absolutely, man. Uh, all listeners out there, go check out, uh, this free resource. It's going to be great. Leo or man, this has been fantastic. We're gonna make sure to put all that stuff in the show notes. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today, man. Thanks for having me. It was a blast. Hey, real quick before we get out of here, if you haven't checked out our Passive Investors Handbook, I would definitely suggest that you start there. This is a great primer for those looking to jump into passive real estate investing. I know you're going to get a lot out of it. It's 15 pages and takes about 20 minutes to get through, and you can find it on our website or just go to upstreaminvestor.com forward slash handbook. So go check that out and enjoy.